Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Elena Bagdasarian, and I am a senior McConnell scholar. It is my privilege tonight to welcome you all here to the McConnell Center for those in attendance, as well as those watching tonight via YouTube. Tonight's events are part of the McConnell Center's year-long effort to read and reflect upon Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. We urge everyone watching to join us in a year-long study of Tocqueville's important analysis of America. You can find full information, including a reading guide, podcasts, and other videos in this series at mcconnellcenter.org. Tonight, it is our honor to have with us Dr. Jonathan Den Hartog to reflect upon what Tocqueville would think if he could see modern social media and globalization and what it all might mean for the future of democracy in America. Dr. Jonathan Den Hartog is Professor of History and Chair of the History Department at Samford University. He received his PhD in American History from University of Notre Dame, and he spent the 2012-13 academic year as the Garwood Visiting Fellow at the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. His first book, Patriotism and Piety, Federalist Politics and Religious Struggle in the New American Nation, was published by the University of Virginia Press in 2015. And most recently, he co-edited a volume on church-state relations in the early republic. His public writing has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and the Hill.com. He is currently completing a biography of the American founder, John Jay, a topic on which he wrote for the McConnell Center in 2008, and which is included in our America's Forgotten Founders book, which will be given away at the end of the lecture. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Jonathan Den Hartog. Great. Well, good evening to everyone. Thanks for coming out on a Thursday night. Um, I should start with a thank you to the McConnell Center for the invitation to come. Uh, I'm grateful for the leadership that uh, Dr. Gary Gregg has provided. And thanks to the entire staff for making this event happen. Uh, and uh, I'll just say that uh, Jessica just earned uh, the Lifesaver of the Year Award by, by helping uh, meet some last minute needs. So, so we're gr really grateful for that. Uh, I've been cheering on the work of the McConnell Center for years from a distance, and so I'm glad I get to do so in person tonight. Uh, I'm grateful for the great services that the McConnell Center offers and provides to U of L students, uh, to Kentucky's teachers, and to the military. Now, one fun note about this, although I think I had read parts of uh, Tocqueville earlier, I, as I was thinking, I said, wait a minute, my first sustained encounter with Democracy in America came uh, on a summer seminar uh, that was led by Gary Gregg. So it's almost like this is coming full circle to be able to talk with Tocqueville, uh, about Tocqueville with you tonight. Uh, and one, might, one other note as we begin uh, this question, what would Tocqueville tweet? Uh, we picked the title earlier this year before Elon Musk decided to change the public name of Twitter to <laughs> X. Uh, I'm still going to call it Twitter. That's how I think of it in my mind. Um, some of my examples might be Twitter specific, but I am using it to think about social media in general. Okay, well, as we launch tonight, um, although my question is, what would Tocqueville tweet? And I have an answer for that by the end of our talk. I want to talk, start with a somewhat uh, side investigation to ask, what is Tocqueville tweeting? Do we see tr traces of Tocqueville on social media? So I dug into Twitter to see where I could find traces of our favorite Frenchman. Here's what I found. A few people did identify with Tocqueville in their handles. So when, when search comes up, people who have Tocqueville in their names. Um, one, one person uh, tweets as Tocqueville 14. Um, with, with the moniker, the axiomatic enemy of the state. Hmm. Considering Tocqueville's view of, of government, I'm not sure Mr. Tocqueville 14 has, has read Tocqueville very closely. Um, similarly, I found a retired accountant uh, and entrepreneur who tweets as Tocqueville Jr. He did share political tweets, but I didn't actually see any connection to Tocqueville. Uh, Tocqueville seems to be a good figure to invoke uh, but not so much deep engagement. Uh, I found some public officials. Uh, they would occasionally reach for a Tocqueville quote out of context. Uh, so for example, uh, Texas US Representative Dan Crenshaw appears fond of Tocqueville, but 
I'm not sure the disconnected quotes were very enlightening. Um, I did find some false quotes attributed to Tocqueville, right? You may have encountered this, that there are things that people say, Tocqueville said this, but it's not actually in democracy in America, it's not actually in anything else. Um, so uh, false, uh, false misattributions ha have proliferated. Um, it is true some political scientists talk about Tocqueville in passing, um, maybe on a very specialized point. Some people reference that they are a scholar of Tocqueville in their bios. I was hopeful when I ran across accounts like, well, Tocqueville, DIA for Democracy in America, uh, it had Democracy in America quotes, but that account hadn't posted in a year, so a little bit stale. Um, another one doing something similar was had even less traffic. Um, I was hoping for more from an account called Tocqueville Memes, right? Meme image with a little text, make a funny point. Um, apparently there were a couple Tocqueville memes in 2019 and nothing since, so the meme well ran dry. Um, institutionally, I found some Tocqueville connections. Um, and this was interesting. Uh, other programs with Tocqueville in their name that uh, appear to operate internationally. Uh, the Tocqueville Foundation uh, is working to promote Tocqueville's thought in France and in Europe. So that's interesting. Uh, Tocqueville IT is working to do so in Italy. Uh, Club Tocqueville is trying to advance Tocqueville's thought in the Spanish-speaking world. Uh, Tocqueville Programa is making a Tocquevillian case in the Netherlands. So I found that interesting that on an international level, there are some institutional oomph to investigating Tocqueville. Okay, so from this survey, I take away two ideas. Uh, first of all, Tocqueville's name and, and likeness is definitely present in Twitter land. You can find his little image uh, in people's profiles, but not a lot of sustained engagement. Uh, in, at best, there's fragmentary engagement. So there's wide open space for bringing in Tocqueville for a social, uh, social media conversation. Further, I'd say there's a wide open space for simply reposting what Tocqueville said, right? Kind of break it up into 240 characters at a time. Um, you could get a long standing account just with that. Okay, that's a free idea for any students who want to take that up. So here's our opportunity tonight, like all of that, plays into this idea, we have an opportunity. There's not enough Tocqueville content online, so we get to reflect on Tocqueville, on free speech, on the free press, and for our era of digital media. And this reflection will take us eventually, I hope, to one step of action. So lots of study, one step of action at the end. So tonight, here's my outline, I, I look to encounter Tocqueville in four separate ways. That is, I have four different hats that I'm going to put on, although they are figurative hats, not literal hats, um, to do this sequentially. I hope to engage with Tocqueville, first of all, as a historian. I'm trained as a historian, so I want to place Tocqueville in his context. Second, I want to engage with Tocqueville's theory, the content of his argument. Third, I want to act as a conversation partner to, to invite Tocqueville to help us think about our present moment. And then finally, and most briefly, as a pundit. So again, we will be present as just a sliver. So we want to set Tocqueville, first of all, in his historical context. And for this audience, you are probably well aware about Tocqueville's French background, uh, his family, his coming to America uh, to research prison systems. Uh, and that, just a reminder, his travel was 1831-32. This timing is interesting because it places him in the United States just with the rise of Andrew Jackson and Jacksonian political democracy. Uh, obviously, he collected information not only by himself, but also with his colleague, Gustave de Beaumont. Uh, and he finds plenty of material to analyze uh, not only uh, prisons, but the nation, right? The operation of democracy understood uh, holistically, not just politics, but, but as a society. He returns to France and writes up his observations, releasing them in two volumes, 
first one in 1835, the second in 1840. This talk will draw on both of them. Obviously, it's rooted in the first volume, but we'll, uh, I think there are some pieces from the second volume to draw in. So Tocqueville, what he witnesses in America is a time of significant change. We could think of these in particular as a communication revolution. That's, that's, that's the key factor for us, a communication revolution, a point hof hopefully made by the historian Daniel Walker Howe. The key image I'd want for us to have is of printing presses expanding, multiplying, and covering the country with cheap and accessible print. Previously, books and print had been primarily the preserve of the well-to-do, but now printed materials flooded the market. Newspapers multiplied, and I think probably newspapers are the headliner. The headline, unintentional pun there, sorry. Um, we have to say that newspapers uh, had the most common example of, of print, and they spread everywhere. Newspapers spoke on many levels to antebellum Americans for many different purposes. But they certainly did speak to politics. Um, they brought political questions to every person's door, alerting people to local politics, to state politics, and to national politics. But it was more than just newspapers. Cheap pamphlets could be mass produced and become cheaply obtainable. Handbills, broadsides could get a message out quickly, right? To just really, really quick delivery to, to your audience. You could also expand on that. Other journals and magazines were published to give a, you might say, medium length development of ideas. Uh, here, publications like uh, the North American Review published essays that sought to elevate public discourse. But uh, North American Review and other journals like that found that their audiences were smaller. So you give up numbers, but you have extended reflection. Technology also helped this along. Presses became larger. They uh, harnessed steam power to speed up production, to expand the volume of production. Even large print runs or print runs of large books became effective through new technology. Stereotype printing was, was the description. Significantly, uh, the most often printed large book was the Bible. In particular, groups like the American Bible Society proved as an important voluntary association, associati associational, uh, grouping, it organized nationwide to get Bibles in the hands of all American citizens. Moreover, they led the way in sending people out to put those Bibles in people's hands. The system that they pioneered didn't wait for people to simply come to them or come to town to buy a volume, but they went out to meet with people and to get the Bibles into their hands. Now, one of the most interesting examples uh, of this explosion of print that I've seen was recently uh, documented by the historian Beth Barton Schweiger. Uh, she was able to document the reading habits of families in the Carolinas before the Civil War. So in the very kind of common, even rural South, she found that in small towns, people still had access to all manner of print. Print connected them to the world, to the world of ideas. So they took them from villages and opened up the nation and the world to them. This empire of print also bolstered the growing array of voluntary associations or public associations. We mentioned the American Bible Society. It's a great example, but there were many others at this time. Their, their efforts expanded immeasurably as they made use of print. Print helped people imagine themselves part of larger, even national movements. Another French visitor, there were more visitors uh, to America than just Tocqueville and Beaumont, um, but Michel Cavalier wrote about this. He said, to improve the means of communication then is to promote a real positive and practical liberty. 
It is to extend to all the members of the human family the power of traversing and turning to account the globe, which has been given to them as their patrimony. It is to increase their rights and privileges of the greatest number, as truly as, and as amply as could be done by electoral laws. So what this other Frenchman observed, something that Tocqueville would agree with, is that communication and travel together were transforming society, liberating and empowering people at the same time. To distribute printed matters, the postal system grew and grew more effective that this was a national endeavor that would help to put print into people's hands. And perhaps not surprisingly, pretty quickly, politicians figured this out. It was Jackson and his Democratic supporters who led the way. Thus, cheap print became a means of the spread of democracy, as it spurred on readers to political involvement. And those partisan political newspapers also benefited from the low rates for the postal system set by Congress. Historians have documented the close ties between newspaper editors and political office holders. Indeed, for many politicians, they started their engagement with working at a party newspaper. Two appropriate examples actually come from Kentucky. When I saw this, I said, I have to bring this up. Francis Blair served the Jacksonian cause by printing the Washington Globe, which was a newspaper. He also edited congressional debates. So sometimes the, you'll, you'll see this reading the congressional debates from the 1830s. It appears, though, that he sometimes edited the debates to make his side look better. So uh, I guess there's power in print there. Another Kentuckian, Amos Kendall, uh, not only used newspaper and the mail to his advantage, but he became one of Jackson's closest advisors. He served as the postmaster general, and so he understood how putting political print into people's hands could have significant effects. So put together, all of this print became mechanisms of trying to articulate, to shape, and to sway public opinion. Right? It's not just that it's written, but it becomes part of public opinion. It made claims to speak for the people, to trace a public opinion that could not have been known otherwise. Right? We don't have the Gallup poll. No one's calling up. No one's doing online surveys. How do you know this? The print is trying to express, to speak for and create a public. This ability to define a public then became a great resource as American democracy move forward. As a result of all this print, Americans became a reading, a writing, and a talking people. Again, according to the historian Daniel Walker Howe, by the 1840s, perhaps sooner, the United States possessed the largest literate public of any nation in world history. Talk about uh, transformational uh, development, a literate population that could then be involved in public matters. This was the world that Tocqueville was exploring, uh, that he was trying to describe, he was trying to make sense of in democracy in America. With that background then, let's turn to democracy in America itself, right? To move from the context to the text. Uh, how did Tocqueville interpret those ideas? How did he wrap them into, a th into theorizing? Uh, so to follow this, I'm putting on my theorist hat, right? This is, this is the second uh, way I'm going to uh, dig into this, to think about Tocqueville's ideas and specifically to relate them to the press and to democracy. And right off the bat, we can say Tocqueville testified to the value of a free press. Uh, he starts off by pointing out how widespread he found newspapers. Uh, he says, in the United States, there's hardly even a small town without its newspaper, right? So we're not just talking uh, large towns, cities. If you have a population, there will be a newspaper. And then he starts to think about this. And what's interesting to me is I think he gives two separate accounts of the role of newspapers. In volume one, 
he gives a partial endorsement of the press. Um, it sounds like he's offering two cheers instead of three, not full-throated, but kind of, kind of moderate in his praise. Uh, because he says, I love the press much more from consideration of the evils it, pre it prevents than the good things it does. Right? It's more important to prevent evils than to do good. But even here, if, if we read that section, um, he does believe that newspapers are doing some good things. As a positive, he sees newspapers spreading reason, public information, and he describes it as enlightenment. So in American democratic society, this information, this, this access to knowledge of the world uh, cuts across regions, it cuts across groups of society, and the mechanism was newspapers. Further, newspapers spurred public discussion. In a great phrase, Tocqueville observes that the press makes political life circulate in all parts of the vast territory. I like that. It circulates discussion. It generates public consideration of political matters. But most importantly, the press prevents evil. Right? He said, I, I prefer it more for the evils it prevents. How so? The freedom of the press is for Tocqueville a great protection of liberty because it prevents the political abuses that lead to despotism. People defend a free press that is a kind of frontline defense of liberty, and in doing so, they end up protecting liberty overall. In volume two, then, Tocqueville returns to newspapers. But he, and he discusses them not for their political function, but for their social function. So volume one is more political, volume two is more social. In a dramatic statement, Tocqueville says, it would diminish newspapers' importance to believe that they serve only to guarantee liberty. Right? So he's suggesting that if you only stop with volume one, you would actually sell newspapers short. Rather, he says, they maintain civilization. This should cause us to pause and think, why would he say this? Preserve civilization? Really? Newspapers? Tocqueville is praising newspapers for their ability in volume two to create associations, right? So these concepts are connected. Newspapers and associations help create each other. Newspapers nurture associations, associations feed into newspapers. They form a self-perpetuating spiral. It's these associations, Tocqueville sees, that also shape public opinion and draw people into public endeavors. They help create the space for civilization to grow. They create a genuine public sphere. So in his concern in volume two to bring people into community, he says associations and newspapers do that. Further, it's this engagement in public life that can build yet another component or characteristic that Tocqueville points to. And he describes this as public spiritedness, public spiritedness. So this public spiritedness, he calls it a love of country that comes not just from instinct, right? You might love where you're from no matter where you're from, but he says it comes from a thoughtful patriotism. And I really like that phrase, thoughtful patriotism. He says this thoughtful patriotism is more fruitful, more durable than one, uh, this one arises from enlightenment. A man learns or knows that the law allows him to contribute to bringing this well-being into, into being. He interests himself in the prosperity of his country. First is something useful to him, and then is his work. So there's a type of civic formation in which the people find their interests aligned with their country's interests, so much so that they will work to serve their country because they see themselves involved in it. So in public spiritedness, Tocqueville sees loyalties building upward. 
from the local to the state to the national. And so this is why he locates the root of political participation in the township first. Right? How does the discussion go? It starts with the township. Social and political engagement happen most in the local settings, and that builds awareness. Um, and this connections to community are then uh, nurtured in associational life, which Tocqueville describes as coming together for any and every purpose. Uh, and the reason people are associating, coming together, is because they both thought and felt that they had a decided interest in their local communities. Okay. This is one point maybe we should asterisk, because this is a point I really want to come back to uh, later in this talk. On the other hand, Tocqueville also saw problems uh, in the culture of democratic America. And this is the next important insight, one that took me a while as a reader to fully grasp of Tocqueville. Because Tocqueville is not simply praising democracy in America, right? He wants to understand it, but in understanding it to point out its problems and to secure something higher, the greatest good for Tocqueville is not democracy proper, but human flourishing, human dignity, and liberty. But to preserve that requires telling some hard truths, pointing out problems and dangers, which Tocqueville says many Americans don't want to hear. So what are some of those problems? Well, the first is the problem of intellectual culture in Americans. Few are trained in deep specialization. And as a result, intellectual culture everywhere was limited. It was present everywhere, but limited everywhere. Americans possess both less specific expertise and an inability to recognize excellence in thought and subjects. And for Tocqueville, he explained this, that it arose from the social reality, right? Social conditions made it hard for people to specialize as young people uh, and therefore, as when they had leisure time, they weren't able to grasp it. So there's intellectual challenges or flattening. The second major problem was what Tocqueville called the tyranny of the majority. And uh, this was his major warning in his first volume, right? He says, what I most criticize about democratic government, and he says, most criticize, that's worth circling, right, is not its weakness. But on the contrary, it's irresistible strength. What repels me is not the extreme liberty that reigns there. It is that the guarantee against uh, tyranny is slight. So the country had not only the practice of democracy, but the celebration of an extreme democracy. And as a result, the majority has trouble uh, conceiving how uh, that could go off track or how it might oppress minorities. And for Tocqueville, this isn't just about practice or laws, it goes to thought. In America, he declares, the majority draws a formidable circle around thought. Within those limits, the writer is free, but woe to him if he goes beyond them. So, the practice of good government could actually be undone if democracy gets out of hand. The third major problem that Tocqueville warned against was individualism. And this theme of individualism looms large in volume two. So I think a lot of the readers aren't there yet, but individualism. Now, we always have to stop and define this here because we, 21st century Americans, are apt to celebrate individualism, right? Rugged individualism, the type of uh, grit that allowed pioneers to uh, carve life out of the forest uh, to build the bluegrass state. But that's not what Tocqueville means, so let me just be clear here. Uh, instead, he describes individualism this way. Individualism is a considered and peaceful sentiment that disposes each citizen to isolate himself from the mass of his fellows and to withdraw to the side with his family and friends so that after creating a small society for his own use, he willingly abandons the large society to itself. So individualism is an abandonment of public things. It's pulling back from social life in favor of private life. It's the undermining of public spiritedness, right? If we wanted that, thoughtful patriotism, 
Individualism undermines that. And Tocqueville observes that this tendency is strongest in uncertain times, when revolutions occur or when there's upheaval in society. So let's pull together these ideas that we've extracted from especially the text of democracy in America. Put together these, in these points, I see Tocqueville deeply warning about the value and the necessity of free discussion of the circulation of ideas as necessary for freedom. But this has to happen in the face of democratic pressures and potential pitfalls. So that's what the text is. The interest and the power then of Tocqueville is that he helps us think through contemporary questions. Here's where I want to become a conversationalist to engage with Tocqueville for our present moment, right? To take a step from context to text, to now to conversation. Um, how might Tocqueville help us think through difficulties that we see in our present day? I think this strategy would have been endorsed by Tocqueville because he wanted not only to observe uh, the country, to observe democracy, but to help it. A passage that I return to often from his introduction. To instruct democracy, to revive its beliefs if possible, to purify its mores, to regulate its movements, to substitute little by little the science of public affairs for its inexperience, the knowledge of its true affairs for its true instincts, to adapt its government to times and places, to modify it according to circumstances and men. Such is the first of duties imposed today on those who lead society. A new political science is needed for a world entirely new. So with Tocqueville, let's think together about how this might instruct democracy today. With Tocqueville, I think it's right to offer some definite warnings about new mediums that have not yet been tamed, not been reckoned with, uh, and not been turned to civic ends. So first of all, we do have to point out dangers. Here are a couple of dangers I see. One, a danger of extreme leveling, right? On social media, the conversations take no account of who is speaking. You might say this does press democratization further, right? There's no uh, inherited status. Uh, maybe the status lies in how many followers they have, but that might be about it. Uh, each, be, each person speaks their opinion into the void. Uh, but is such sounding off really helpful for either self-government or good government? Uh, the background, the experience of speakers is made to seem irrelevant. Uh, and on some digital platforms, status within institutions actually seems a hindrance. That is, the medium tends to militate against institutional standing or the development of expertise. So the conversations might often elevate voices unequally or without deserve. The mechanisms thus prioritize personal preening or platform building over deep investment in social institutions, a point Yuval Levin has recently made. Further, I see this accelerating the tendency that the scholar Tom Nichols describes as the death of expertise. Whereas society previously had clear markers for designating those who had earned the possibility of speech and leadership, technology is working to blow that up, leading people to suspect that any claim is just as good as any other claim. Right? Why are you in any position to make a claim? Of course, we also have to admit that uh, this reality is complicated by the fact that experts, especially in the last couple of years, haven't really covered themselves in glory. So uh, being pulled into social media uh, debates doesn't always help. So that's a danger. Next, social media carries the danger of a false impression of public opinion. The technology promises, I think, falsely to represent in real time what the public is thinking. Here's the illusion. Aggregated numbers might look large. There might be some real people there, but there might also be trolls, bots, automated accounts. 
And let's not forget that only a small percentage of the public is active on any given social media site. None of these sites represent the public, but only the slice of the public that happens to be active on the site at the moment. Further, although social media is a public space, it's fractured. It's not representative. It can become its own bubble. In fact, fun studies have shown that if Twitter were a political community, it would be to the political left of San Francisco. So <laughs> that might, uh, might help us triangulate how the conversations progress. So we should speak cautiously before we take any lessons on opinion from social media. That false public opinion, however, here's the irony, this is why we're warning about it, uh, can create a tyranny of the majority, right? Tocqueville warned about a tyranny of, of the majority, this can come in. And I think this is where the sense of cancel culture applies. Very quickly, firestorms can arise as a large enough number of accounts, whether that's people or not, uh, can be convinced to hector the speaker of an unpopular opinion. That experience uh, can quickly become unpleasant enough to drive a person off of a platform and away from speaking to the public, whereas they, they had thought, oh, this is a way of engagement. It becomes more painful uh, than to continue. Now, this mirrors what Tocqueville described as the power of the democratic majority over thought. Again, he, he, Tocqueville warns, in democratic republic, republics, tyranny, it's an interesting word, tyranny, leaves the body alone and goes right to the soul. Democracy says, you are free not to think as I do. Your life, your goods, everything remains with you. But from this day on, you are a stranger among us. You will keep your privileges as a citizen, but they will become useless to you. The alter alternative approach, or maybe the resulting effect, is disengagement from public life, right? The, half of it is canceled by an audience, the other half is withdrawal. Because Tocqueville imagines the man roasted by this public opinion. Those who censor him speak openly, he says. And those who think as he does, without having his courage, keep quiet and distance themselves. He gives in, finally, under the daily effort. He yields, he returns to silence, as though he felt remorse for having told the truth. So I would describe this pressure as the effort of forcing individualism, right, Tocquevillian individualism in action. Remember, Tocqueville said that's unhealthy. It's not moving forward. It's a retreat to the private. By leaving public discourse uh, and leaving behind the regret that it causes, there's creature comforts, there's private concerns. People say, hey, I can, I can go enjoy my flat screen TV, uh, watch, watch football, and enjoy my family. Uh, so ironically, the mechanisms that promise the public engagement end up training people to be silent, to be disengaged, forced into private life, not public engagement. Um, and so this reduces discussion, this discusses, diminishes associations. Social media ironically causes us to bowl alone more. Right? Robert Putnam in the 1990s said there's this decline of associations. It's only uh, grown, that disengagement has only grown. I think social media is a part of it. So social, social media, right, social is actually privatizing our concerns. I think that's an irony. And one final warning is that social media tends to nationalize our perspective, right? Tocqueville called this nationalization a type of centralization. We follow the numbers, we follow the eyeballs. Uh, and Tocqueville warned against it. And, but social media might train us to think either only about national affairs or to think that the concerns of a faraway state are our concerns. Elections are nationalized. Our politics are nationalized. In contrast to even a generation ago when Tip O'Neill said all politics is local, politics aren't functioning that way anymore. 
further, we're drawn into a national concern. Okay, if I stop there, we might all be tempted to despair, turn out the lights, go home, and as we said, enjoy our flat screen TVs. Let's not do that, okay? I, let's hold on to one piece that will build where I want to go with this. Um, let me draw on one other element, and that was something that I had marked earlier, which is his insights about the priority of the local, about social participation, should be encouraging. I think Tocqueville says this, and I think we should think about this, to think about the local, think about that which is in our power to change, which will almost certainly be closer to home, close to where we can bring about effects on small scale. Further, that local change can happen when we work not by ourselves, but in cooperation with others. Forming new associations can actually multiply our effects, again, at the local level. It's possible also to nurture patriotism at the local level, thoughtful patriotism, uh, because we can see it here at hand. And at the local level, in real community, we can speak freely. We can engage in actual conversation. Even if I disagree, I'm much less likely to flame you if you're a real person talking to me rather than random uh, kind of icon online. And if we respect our neighbors, we might find areas of common ground and cooperation to ease polarization. Now I see a vision, if I, to paint a vision of this, I actually see this in a work of art. I, I wanna kind of conclude with, with a work of art uh, painted by the great American artist Norman Rockwell. Uh, during World War II, Rockwell painted a series of paintings called The Four Freedoms. And his most political was his freedom of speech painting. So this kind of connects to our discussion of discussion. He captured a town meeting in his local town in New England. It his freedom of speech painting depicts a, a working class man standing up. He has rough hands, a flannel shirt, a distressed leather jacket, standing up to express his opinion. Wood later said, or yeah, Rockwell later admitted, yeah, he used his local gas station attendant as his model. In the painting, the pillars of the town are present, wearing suits, very formal, yet, those men are listening to their fellow citizen, even though they disagree. It's through public deliberation and free speech that the political community of the town has become visible and operational. The goal for us then, I'd encourage, is to nurture those spaces where public speech and interaction can reassert themselves over against the temptation of a social media that tends to nationalize, centralize, but then ultimately privatize us. So, what would Tocqueville tweet? We're entirely speculating here, right? I recognize that. He may have loved this, right? He may have scrolled through cat videos incessantly. But with all this analysis, I kind of think not. Okay. Uh, so here's my moment to totally be a pundit and to be really present-minded, uh, and you can, Q&A can tell me I'm totally off base, but that's okay. Let me suggest that Tocqueville's uh, tweeting would invite people into real, sustained deliberation at the local level necessary to create an actual political community. So, it might sound something like this, speculation, but it might sound something like this, friends, Come and join me at a public location. Here, insert location. Maybe it would be the McConnell Center at the University of Louisville. Let us have a free and open conversation about our community, our state, and our nation. And then I think he would close with, no video or social media allowed. And as they say online, that's it. That's the tweet. Thank you.
So I think we have some time for questions. Thank you again, uh, Professor Den Hartog. Um, so yeah, we will be, um, please wait for the mic to reach you to ask your question so our online audience can hear and make sure to phrase it as a question rather than extended comment. My name is Bradfield Ross. I'm a uh, sophomore scholar. I just wanted to know, you talked briefly about the uh, misuse of quotes from Tocqueville and the false quotes you saw. Were there any particular political purposes or ideas or large kind of ideological trends that these quotes were misused and falsified for? Okay. Uh, so so the, the question was about the, the misuse of false Tocqueville. <laughs> um, there, there were two that recurred a lot that, that I saw. Um, one uh, was uh, the, the claim that Tocqueville says uh, the, the government will continue only until uh, they find that they can uh, pay themselves out of the public treasury, um, which to my understanding is not in democracy in America. Uh, so for, for that one, it's, it's a sense of uh, beware of public spending, right? which that might be an issue, but it's definitely one of those cases that Tocqueville did not say. The other false Tocqueville quote that I saw a lot, um, I, I'm leery, uh, I, I understand that a subsequent speaker is actually gonna talk about this false statement. When Professor uh, Tracy McKenzie comes, I understand he's on the schedule, uh, he has a great presentation on, on this claim that Tocqueville said, America is great because America is good. Um, false statement, Tocqueville never said this, and so it's, uh, it's a uh, encouragement to virtue Again, I'm in favor of virtue. I'm in favor of virtue. I'm just not a fan of misquoting Tocqueville to get to that point. So it, it does seem that Tocqueville is the symbol for things that we like, right? Uh, Tocqueville said Americans love mom, baseball, and apple pie or something, right? Might be true, but is not Tocqueville. So again, one, one great re way or reason to read Tocqueville is to find out when his name is being manipulated for uh, false purposes. Um, my name is Riley Maddox, I'm a freshman. Um, so earlier this year, we had a speaker come and talk to us about um, patriotism in the age of extremes. And he talked about how um, to kindle this type of positive patriotism, we should have like conversations with um, local people and, and disagree and sort of kind of um, what you were saying about like having local conversations and leaving social media out of it. Um, and you kind of, sorry, I'm looking at my notes. You kind of talked about this idea of thoughtful patriotism and would you agree that to kindle thoughtful patriotism, um, we are like, how would, how would one go about, I guess, kindling thoughtful patriotism in our society um, as a lot of times patriotism is associated with like white nationalism and other things. Um, and that's kind of what our speaker talked about um, at the beginning of the year. Great, yeah, good, good question. So in the, in the passage where, where Tocqueville deals with, uh, with thoughtful patriotism, right? So the first contrast that he makes is he says there's, there's kind of an instinctual patriotism, um, which he, he says is fine, but that's, that's everywhere, right? We, this is where you grew up. This is what's, what's familiar to you. You, you love that. But there, there's nothing really uh, distinctive or powerful about that. Um, but then he says there's this uh, thoughtful patriotism, which is, is twofold, I, I guess, uh, to go to your question. Uh, the first part of it, it's informed, right? It's uh, the one part about being thought, having a thoughtful patriotism is know about your country, right? So, so that would be my first uh, urging to people, or, or my first desire even for our whole country, right? Whoever sees this on YouTube, um, is that they, they learn about American institutions, uh, American constitutionalism, uh, and the kind of wide range of American history, uh, not simply dismissing it out of hand. So, so first of all, to have thoughtful patriotism, you need knowledge. But then he goes beyond that, and he, he really ties into this sense that uh, thoughtful patriotism is a 
rational engagement with public life. So I think what we would say is we want to encourage people, and people in this room, or again, any, anyone who stumbles on this, to say, I have a, there's, there's a little bit of self-interest rightly understood, right? I have a, a proper interest in uh, contributing to the good of my community, state, and nation, right? And that's, that's what I wanted to really harp on is the way it builds upward even in Tocqueville, not down, right? We're, we're tempted, it's a centralizing tendency that if we solve everything in Washington, then in all of our communities, everything will work out. And Tocqueville is saying the proper understanding of this concern is to uh, start low and then build upward. And so then you see that if I contribute to the common good, this will help me as well. So uh, both for individual interest and the common good, we need to have that, that concern. And I think that's what he means by thoughtful patriotism. Good. Hi, I'm Cameron. I'm a junior scholar. Uh, you spoke a little bit to the death of expertise that comes through social media. I'm just wondering, we see that in politics and in so many other realms. Is there something that we can do to fight that back to make sure that the ones that we're trusting and listening to do know what they're talking about? Right. Uh, we're, we're definitely, uh, so I wanted to connect this to, to Tocqueville, right, where, where he says that there's this danger that democracy loses a sense of expertise. And then social media just kind of pours gasoline on that and uh, exacerbates it a lot more. Um, what would my recommendation be? Um, well, first of all, become knowledgeable ourselves, right? Uh, so when Tocqueville says, you know, part of the problem of the loss of expertise is people don't know what expertise looks like, right? We should learn to recognize what expertise looks like in our field, whatever that is, and then hopefully we can see a parallel in other fields, right? We can, we can recognize when people are truly analyzing things or when they're just spouting off. So I think we can educate ourselves that way. Um, and I think we, we can uh, encourage others to listen, not, and it's, it's not simply a trust the experts, right? I, I think it's very healthy to, to uh, have some skepticism, but that should be tempered by realizing that for those who have invested time and often years to learn something that there, there is a value and a way to that, right? They have earned the right to speak. So I guess that's what I would say is find ways or places where the people who have earned the right to speak are speaking. Right. There, maybe there needs to be a, a, so somewhat of a barrier to entry and not just anybody can say whatever they want. All right, so I think that closes up our Q&A portion. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Den Hartog. And we were just wondering. <laughs> and as everyone, uh, whenever they came in here, saw that we got have a little raffle for America's Forgotten Founders. So we were just wondering if you could pull some names out of the basket to announce to some of our winners. Yeah. How many were we drawing? I think five, yeah. Five, OK. Should I read these? Yeah, go ahead. First one, uh, William Van Handorf. Handorf? Yeah. Woo! Yeah. We'll, we'll deliver these after the, after yeah. the fact, right? Yeah. OK. Riley Maddox. <laughs> Number three, uh, Bradfield Ross. Not, not, not a setup, but, but bonus points for the people who ask questions, right? Uh, Laureen Lahmeyer, right? And number five, Jillian Sarver. So, there we go. Enjoy those. It's an excellent collection. All right. Well, thank you again to everyone in the audience today. Um, again, thank you to um, Dr. Den Hartog for coming and speaking with us. And thank you to everyone who joined online. Uh, we welcome you to keep up with the series um, and other related lectures um, on mcconnellcenter.org. And we also welcome you to come back on November, I think, 8th at 6 p.m. We are having uh, Dr. Tracy McKenzie discussing Tocqueville's relationship um, with Christianity and America. Um, so thank you again.